The vast white beauty of the season of winter reaches gracefully toward the sleeping mountains, and there, in the beauty of its flowing crystal sculptures, we miss seeing the simple presence of color. Even our warm, wild creatures know it's not easy finding green under a blanket of snow, but it's nice to have a friend to help you look. It is in this season of winter that we celebrate the Bethlehem birth of the child Jesus. Bishop Sheen says, it was a breakthrough in time that changed our world, for we found a belief that is the love of the truth. Unbelief is dread of the truth about ourselves. That's unbelief. Faith is a willingness to face the truth about ourselves. And when we do, well, once that original dread is overcome and we admit the breakthrough, then we're changed. And then our mind is illumined, our will is strengthened, we have a great joy and happiness. lovely, isn't she? Beautiful. Hi there. I'm Cameron Mitchell, and I want to wish happy holidays to all of you. Christmas is our time of love and goodwill, a moment in the portrait of history when a bright silver star high in the night sky gave off a close and holy light, and the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Christmas is also a time of giving, and we've wrapped up a special present just for you, filled with hugs, kisses, joy, hope, and sunshine. It's a Christmas gift of love from a friend of yours, Fulton J. Sheen. He calls it Superman and Christmas, a unique comparison of fantasy and truth, a breakthrough in history, blessed by the birth of a child of grace, peace, and love. Friends, a mother told her little boy to go into the parlor and turn on television. He was distracting the mother. And he turned the dial and he caught a picture of me on television. He ran out, said to his mother, Ma, Superman. Oh. <laughs> well, here is Superman in a new costume with even a new title tonight. Superman and Christmas. What has Superman got to do with Christmas? You know what Superman does, Batman. And then these men, we have mother planets. Isn't it interesting how many of those we have in our world today who, uh, first of all, seem to come from somewhere else? just as Superman does. And quickly he changes his costume. He puts on, he goes into a telephone booth or a closet, just as an ordinary mortal, and he puts on the form and the habit of Superman. And then once he's broke through with this great power of his, then he begins to do wonders. He relieves us in our afflictions, helps damsels in distress, defends those who have been persecuted, the lover of the poor and the socially disinherited. And this intensely pleases the American people. Why is it that programs of this kind are so popular? I think there's a subconscious reason, almost an unconscious one. First of all, we know that the help that we need is not just among us ordinary mortals and the affairs of daily life. If we are to have the inner strength that we need, it has to come from outside. We've never expressed this, perhaps in so many words, 
but we know the need of it. And Superman, Batman, and men from other worlds, they satisfy our needs, at least from the point of view of imagination. They give us what we lack. We know that of and by ourselves we are not enough. Just as the music that we love is the music we already have in our own hearts, so too the amusements that we like are the unconscious expressions of hidden desires. Superman is the desire for Christmas. It should not be hard for our generation to understand Christmas. Now I'm going to show you how Superman and Christmas are somewhat alike. I really didn't need to use this blackboard tonight, but uh, I'm going to use it just for this one illustration so my angel can clean it. It would be terrible to have a Christmas show and not use my angel. <laughs> The Superman comes from outside. There's a kind of a breakthrough. Is that clear? Oh, yes, it gets clearer, doesn't it? As you're right. This is unusual chalk. <laughs> Invisible chalk. First, there's a breakthrough. And then, because he helps others, there is a kind of a renovation, a strength, strengthening, an aiding. Now, Christmas is just this. First, there is a breakthrough. And instead of someone going into a closet and taking on the form and the substance of a superman. The breakthrough this time is the God, God coming down to earth, breaking through time, splitting it, splitting it so much so that from that time on to this, it's B.C. and A.D. But there's this difference from Superman, and this is very important. Superman goes from weakness to power. The breakthrough of Christmas is from power to weakness. You saw the picture of the crib when the show began. Here is infinity and littleness. See, this isn't a man getting strong. This is a God becoming weak. He who made the world is in the world, even rejected by it. He who made the nest is nestled therein. The tiny little hands that are not quite long enough to reach the huge heads of the cattle are the hands that hold the reins, that steer the sun and moon and stars in their courses. He's wrapped in swaddling bands. Divinity, enclosed, wrapped, confined, cabin, cribbed, helpless as a babe. What a difference between Superman and this breakthrough. Not a manifestation of power to 
please the pride of man with humility to humble man's pride. This, uh, this idea of a God becoming a man that you saw there in the crib is something that's very hard for us to realize. Just suppose a... Suppose you love dogs. And you were sorrowful for the way dogs were treated by some masters or neglected. And you had the power to dispossess yourself of your body. But you could do with your soul what you wanted. And you took that soul of yours and you put it into the body of a dog. And when you did that, you would resolve, but rarely to exceed the limitations of that dog organism. What a humiliation that would be. You know, you know that you had a mind that could write poetry and that could study science and absorb literature and understand Dante and Aquinas, and yet here you were in the body of a dog. And then there would be another humiliation. And that other humiliation would be because you went into the organism of a dog, you would have to associate with other dogs, knowing all the while that you were better, that you were a man. You think it humbling to become a dog just simply to give dogs examples of good conduct? Well, what do you think it is for this breakthrough? Not going into a closet, but going into a stable and a crib. being bound with swaddling bands. That's the difference in the Superman, weakness instead of power. And then the other difference is that Superman, when he comes to this earth of ours to do his wonders, only touches the environment. He touches what is outside of man. In other words, I've never seen chalk like that before. <laughs> Angel, where did you get it? <laughs> You've got to wait for an effect. It's like telling a funny story. It just doesn't happen all at once. <laughs> all that he, all the Superman does is to change circumstances on the outside. But he does not touch man on the inside. That's the difference. And when God becomes man, when we have Christmas, he leaves circumstances very much the way they are. He leaves Roman soldiers parading through the streets. The same problems, pain and suffering and hunger and so forth, but he begins reforming the hearts of men. And once they are reformed, then, if they live according to his way, then they'll do away with these boring things of indigence and suffering. So the God-man works in the heart of a man. It's very much as if... Now, I wonder if my angel will use an invisible eraser. <laughs> now... This, uh, this internal operation of God when he comes to this earth may be likened to, uh, to a plague. Suppose that there was oh, something in the world today like the Black Death during the Middle Ages. Remember that wiped out one-third of the population of Europe? And suppose a great scientist found a remedy for that plague. And he made the remedy available to the whole human race. 
And there would be some who would come to be relieved. Others might not. Now that's just exactly what happened when God came to this earth. We're all willing to have our circumstances changed. We like to have more money. Maybe live in a different house. But do we want our thinking changed? Do we want our loves changed? And the God-man who came to this earth came for the remedy for moral and spiritual plagues. He came to make us happy on the inside. Not everyone wants it. He came into his own, and his own received him not. Now this is Christmas in terms of the Superman. Now let me reduce it to a concrete case. The breakthrough, how he operates through what we call his grace. It means an illumination of the intellect and a strengthening of character. I did a great deal of work in my life in Soho Square District of London is the international area of London. And in one church there, because I was an American, I had to get up early and read the first mass. The English sleep late. <laughs> well, this was Christmas morning. Christmas. And that night there had been a heavy London fog. Believe me, our smogs here in New York are nothing compared to the fog of London. When I opened the door, a limp figure fell in. It was a young woman. She'd been asleep against the door. It was almost frozen. And I said, how, how did you happen to be here? She said, I don't know, Father. I said, oh, Father. Yes, she said, I... I used to be a Catholic, but not anymore. I said, how did you happen to be here? Well, she said, I, I don't know, I was a bit drunk. Well, I said, men often drink because they like the stuff, and women drink because they don't like something else. What didn't you like? <laughs> well, she said, I didn't like the three men. She says that I was going with, and they were beginning to find it out. I was playing false to them. So I got drunk. What is your name? She told me your name pointing to a, a uh, billboard on the Cross and Blackwell Jam office building across the way. I said, is that your picture there? Yes, she says, I'm the leading lady in that musical comedy. Well, I went in, made her a cup of coffee, <coughs> and I said, come back now this afternoon. And she said, uh, I will come back on one condition. that you don't ask me to go to confession. I said, all right. She said, I want you to promise me faithfully that you will not ask me to go to confession. I said, I promise you faithfully not to ask you to go to confession. So she came back that afternoon before matinee. And uh, I said, we have a, a Rembrandt and a Van Dyck in this church. Would you like to see them? She said, yes. So as we walked down the side aisle, we passed the confessional box. I pushed her in. <laughs> I didn't ask her to go. I always keep my promises. Well, she went to communion. She was there month after month, and... And then she became a nun in London. And she's still living as a nun. Now here you see the breakthrough. Not the breakthrough into a crib, but the breakthrough, well, into a stable. A heart that's a stable. And then when the breakthrough happened, there was a change a renovation of heart and character so that she was no longer what she was before. It was not the outside that was changed. It was the inside. 
Now, that's what Christmas is. Christmas is not just something that has happened. It's something that is happening. And some of us, we're afraid of it. It's very much like people go through life not knowing they have cancer. They're unhappy, they're, un they're sick, they're a bit miserable, but they don't know why. If a doctor tells them that they have cancer, then their whole attitude toward life changes. They may be even able eventually to find a remedy. So people stay away from this babe of Christmas. They stay away from Christ. They're a bit afraid. Unbelief is dread of the truth about ourselves. That's unbelief. Faith is a willingness to face the truth about ourselves. And when we do, well, once that original dread is overcome and we admit the breakthrough, then we're changed. And then our mind is illumined, our will is strengthened, we have a great joy and happiness. So I say, therefore, it's hard for some people to accept Christmas. But I'm going to give you a tip because I'm talking to everybody. I always do on television. If you do not want to start there, in that stable, with the full recognition of that breakthrough, I will tell you where to start. Start loving your fellow man. Start loving your neighbor. And begin to love him, not just because of what he can do for you, or because of any pleasure anyone gives you, but just love him as a fellow man, and then eventually you begin to see that he's a creature of God. The only unhappy people in this world are the people who are selfish. And I have known in this world some people who just loved humanity. Won't you begin to love really and truly? Please do that for me and you'll eventually come to know the true meaning of Christmas. Then you'll have a Merry Christmas. Happy Christmas, Bishop Sheen. Happy Christmas. In your presence, there is a benediction and a grace. In your memory, we have lit the candles of fellowship and hope knowing that our experiences of unity and human relationships are more compelling than the concepts, fears, and prejudices which divide us. These tiny flames must burn in our hearts all year long. Happy Christmas, Bishop Sheen. Bye now, and God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly, life is worth living.